Welcome to the show where we focus on leadership and development in Africa. This week, we take a look at youth and elections. We host a session at the University of Nairobi with Rotaracts from across Kenya, Dr. PLO Lumumba and myself get a chance to speak to the students. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. This week on the show, we get together with young Africans and we ask ourselves, what is the importance of their role in elections? We look at the question of peace. We look at roles, rights and responsibilities. Let's get straight to the discussion at the University of Nairobi in Kenya with Rotaracts from across the country. I connected with uh, the Rotary uh, most recently when uh, Muthaiga was having one of its meetings and it was such a pleasure to be there and just to see the Rotarian spirit, which I really connect with. Um, we're talking about peace today, so let me focus on that as I start. The issue is why are we so quick to undermine the value of peace? What's the problem? Why do we think peace is a dirty word? Um, so there's something that we need to deal with, whether it's in our communities or in our homes specifically. However, I realized that somehow in Kenya we have taught people that exercising your right to vote is more important than the life and the liberty of the person next to you. I don't understand how we got that confused. Because haki yangu ni haki yako pia. Yes or no? If I have a right to vote, you have a right to vote too. And I don't have a right to ask you why or how you're voting the way you vote. So we're in an environment, first of all, where we need to appreciate processes and systems and fix them, yes? But we also need to develop a love and respect for each other that says that your comfort, safety, and security is more important to me than my vote. I hosted a show after I left NTV called Fist to Five for Change. How many of you watched that show? A few hands have gone up. So what we did was we brought perpetrators of violence from a particular area into a room with victims of violence. And we went through a process with them where we start by saying we will listen to each other's truths. Right? Even if I don't agree with what you're saying, I'll hear what you're saying so that we can understand what each of us believe. And then we'll talk about what actually happened. So where you were, what did you see and what happened? And we'll discuss that. Then at the end, we ask ourselves, how did it go so wrong? And we look for common ground. What was amazing about that show is at the end of the three episodes we would do with these groups, somebody would inevitably say, let's hold hands and pray together. And I can promise you, when they first came into a room, they could not even look each other in the eye, there was so much hatred. In Western Kenya, I'll just give you one example that touched me and made me ask a lot of questions. In Western Kenya, when we did the show for that region, we were told about a Kikuyu businessman who had a shop and the public believed that he was uh, harboring, um, uh, what are they called, ballot papers ballot boxes fake, with fake ballot papers in his shop, right? So the rumor went round, the rumor went round, people got upset, they said, we're not having our votes stolen. Let's go. So they went to the shop. This guy has lived his whole life, his children have grown up in Kakamega, knew the community very well, and they said, but this was wrong, so we went in, what did you do? They said, we burnt his shop. I said, you burnt it to the ground? They said, we burnt it. I said, okay, what else? They said, okay, honestly, we also ransacked it. So we stole a lot of stuff. Okay, you burned the shop, you stole a lot of stuff. Was he and his family okay? They said, hey, they made it by the skin of their teeth. Because they were going to burn in that shop, but they ended up in a camp. All right? So I said, okay, they made it. And we talked about it. And then I asked, so did you find the ballot boxes? When I asked, did you find the ballot boxes? They looked at each other like... Are you hearing my silence? Then they said to each other, did you see ballot? Did you? They said, no, we didn't find any ballot boxes. Guys, 
let me tell you, the danger of a false narrative and the power and juicy appeal of a false narrative is the easiest thing for a politician to use to turn you into the machine that he requires to achieve his end. The only thing we must say, and we must say this with clarity, is I will protect the right of my neighbor to safety and security. Are we together on that one? And if you're right, if we feel something goes wrong in an election or elsewhere, we shall even demonstrate together, but we shall demonstrate peacefully because there's such thing as non-violent action. Nobody says you don't fight injustice, but you don't fight injustice by hurting the innocent. And inevitably, conflict and violence, you can't tell where it goes. When you light a fire, you can try to contain a fire. But look, I've been at the front line of all of this. I saw those politicians in 207. Some of them were in a panic because it had gone so far, right, that they didn't even know how to start pulling it back. And we cannot be the fools that just march ahead without asking ourselves, what do we value? And if we truly value justice, then the first thing I believe we should say is I want you and your children and your mother and your father safe just as I want my children, my mother and my father safe. After that, we can even hold hands together and march on that street, but we shall do it peacefully like we have been taught by Gandhi, like we have been taught by Martin Luther King Jr., and like we have been taught by Mandela. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peace is something that we talk about, is something that we think is good and it is good. But what begets peace? In my mind, peace is the child of the intercourse between justice and truth. Justice and truth beget peace. Peace does not exist in a vacuum. Throughout the ages, men and women have talked about peace because in times of peace there is prosperity. Throughout the ages, we have always preached peace alongside justice. But you must never stop preaching peace. Because these fire-eating pseudo-revolutionaries who are champagne revolutionaries who talk about war and then they go to their houses driving Mercedes Benzes have never known war. When there is war, your mothers are raped in your presence. When there is war, you are raped. Your sisters and your wives and you are sodomized. You only have to have a conversation with South Sudanese refugees, the Congolese refugees, the Rwandese refugees, the Burundian refugees, and there is no shortage of refugees to know that war is not something that you long for. I'm not too active on social media, but occasionally I receive some of the goings on in the social media written by men and women who supposedly have gone to school and supposedly are of sound mind and they are beating the drums of war. They can do it in the comfort of their rooms, tweeting and going on Facebook. The day war comes, there'll be no Twitter, there'll be no Facebook, there'll be no food. It will be sorrow and lamentation. And history has demonstrated times without number that when countries break down, bringing them together is not easy. The Democratic Republic of Congo went off rail in 1961 when Patrice Semeri Lumumba was murdered. It has never been the same again. Somalia went under and over 20 years later it cannot be put together. 
Central African Republic went under and it cannot be put together. So you are here. Go out there into the social media. Talk in your own way in the main ways of modernity. Tell those who are tweeting war and violence that they know not what they talk about. Those who are using Facebook and sharpening our tribal sensibilities, tell them that they know not what they are talking about. Those who are using WhatsApp and other modern media to inflame our ethnic sensibilities, tell them that they know not what they talk about. Tell them that throughout history it is peace that has underwritten human development. Your own four-way test tells you in a most succinct fashion the ingredients that if embraced will guarantee peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. So the message that we have here today is that you should be warriors for peace. You may not be heard even in your purest tones, but the warrior is he or she who survives to fight another day. Cowardice is not equivalent to being careful. Recklessness is not bravery. So you young Africans, you young Kenyans, you rotaractors, you who dreamt a good dream, you have done a good thing because there is no point of dreaming and doing nothing about it. Remember that all great movements started with only a few. Christ, over 2,000 years ago, had only 12 disciples. One of them was consumed by greed. But the world has never been the same again since he set his foot on this earth. The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fought many battles. The battle of Badri, the battle in Mecca. But throughout all these battles, he always took the view that peace was the be all and all. In the great Mahabharata, those of you who are Hindus, the great battle between good and evil at Kurushestra was fought. But Lord Krishna was clear that there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Currently, as a country, we, we are very much struggling with political patronage. So what I wanted to ask you, as a youth of this country, how best do you think it is, or what, what exactly is it can we do so as to, you know, give the small, I wouldn't say small, but rather, whereby you have people who are voting not for the party, but for the candidate. So what can we do as the young people of this country? My question is, as all of us, as students, as citizens of, the, of our country, we are all participating. I've heard there's so many things about peace that is being that people are participating in. Even here in campus, you'll see so many posters for, for different organizations, people want peace. What can be done to make our leaders accept that these are the results of the polls? Because once they just tell, they can tell their people and they have influence. What can we do to reach out to, there's that drunkard in Kibera who just wants to fight. There's that um, conductor in Odaya who thinks that Raila is 
is a bad guy or thinks that anyone is a bad guy what can we do to to send the right message to them that they, in a way that they can understand there's a lot of fear that should one party take the seat this other side of uh, you know like if this tribe takes it one tribe will suffer etc etc that rhetoric is i'm not sure true i would like also for you to weigh in on that is it quite true that should one tribe take the seat like given the nature that our technocrats are highly reliant on the politicians like for a road to be built an mcr to step in for a sewer line to be installed an mpr to talk somewhere so uh what are we going to do to move away from all that shift the power from the politics to the educated so in my view look at all the individuals that are on the ballot paper they are not the best that kenya have but they are the ones in the market and in this market i'm urging you to buy something it is important that you take the lesser of the evils presented to us but ask yourself holding all factors constant can we give this man or this woman the benefit of doubt and cast your vote you'll find one you'll find a jubilate if there is a good jubilate in the formation cast your vote in their favor if there is a good nasarite do the same if there is a good independent cast the same in the hope that from the 9th day of august we must begin a process of sanitizing kenyan politics i've written two books myself which one of them is called a call for hygiene in kenyan politics and the other one is called sanitizing kenyan politics and i'm speaking about these things not because i have the monopoly of idea or knowledge but because i have a perspective which if you allow to be cross fertilized with yours will possibly give something that is worthy thank you number 1 it doesn't matter i have a preferred candidate but if my preferred candidate loses my life does not end i will have breakfast the next day <laughs> i will continue working life goes on and this is the fallacy that we fed ourselves can i assure you the poor boy in odaya is and poor girl in odaya is struggling as hard as the one in bondo exactly the same So don't be cheated and let me tell you something else technocrats run this country politicians don't run this country it's something that we don't know technocrats know how to work the system they play the game they do the work they actually very often work the politicians there are some politicians who come in and are able to understand and bully their way through but don't ever be cheated as a people that if a certain person loses that your day tomorrow is over that's the fallacy and i think that's what we need to hold on to as a nation and if we do see that any community is being disenfranchised we need to stand up and say it and i'm glad that the constitution of kenya today actually has funds that go to those who have been most disenfranchised so there's a recognition that we all want to be on an equal par um and then the question that was about the politicians and how to get them how to sensitize them and force them to come to the table and make the right decisions i know the un and other partners have been trying to get them to sign decrees and all the all manner of things right but i started living my life a long time ago saying we cannot influence what everybody else does but if the mass if the population heads a certain direction and says this is what we expect they actually have to listen to us and they do pay attention to public sentiment so i think the same question that was asked to plo about parties can we start to be the change and when we start and that momentum starts to move you will start to see them align to our expectations or be voted out and you young men and women who are here your duty is to go out there was it mother teresa of calcutta who said when you go into a room and there is darkness you don't complain about the darkness you light a candle and you ask your neighbor to light a candle and lo and behold light will conquer darkness if you go to the nairobi hospital there is uh, uh, their motto there looks in tenebris light in darkness mwangaza katika giza you are the light 
Don't look for any others. Don't look for solution there. Go out and shout. Today, when you are tweeting or Facebook or Instagram, make sure that you are sending this message loud and clear. The last question is about this drunkard. And this, you know, if you read the history of the Soviet Union, Vladimir Lenin used to say that there are people that you must listen to very keenly. Drunkards. And madmen and women. They have no inhibitions. They tell the truth as it is. And I'm urging us that those are the people that we must talk to. I've been, many of us who are in the middle class don't walk into this. I've been, because I grew up in Nairobi, so I go into Mukuruku and Jenga, Mukuruku and Yaba, and where I grew up in Jericho and Maringo. And I go there every two weeks just to commune with the, the people that I lived with. And I'm telling you they want peace. I have a friend who's a doctor in the UK and she goes to a church in London where everybody's white and a little bit elderly. So she's the only black person in the church. But she's been going there for a long time. During the post-election violence, she told me that every Sunday, these people, who most of them maybe had barely any connection with Kenya, would say, announce in the church, those who would like to stay back to pray for Kenya please stay back. And the majority of people in the church would stay back to pray for Kenya. I want you to think about that for a minute. A friend of mine who is Israeli said, Kenya is blessed. And in their language, Kenya means nest of God. Kenha, nest of God. So many people look at this country and have belief in us. And in so many ways, all we spend time doing is talking about how useless we are, how corrupt we are, how horrible we are, how tribal we are. There's nothing wrong with belonging to a tribe. There's something wrong when you use that in a negative way. So let's embrace our differences and use them in a positive way. So I'm going to ask you, live a life knowing that the impossible is possible, as we were told by Mandela. Live a white life inspiring yourself and inspiring the people around. Be the one in the conversation on Twitter who comes in and says, Hey, guys, come on. You know? Let's go this way. How about we try this way? Be that voice. And if just 10% of us in the room can spread that, we will transform this country. Imagine if all of us take that away with us. So that's my hope and my dream for this country and for you guys as well. Thank you. <laughs> Kenya is a great country. And anybody you talk to from different parts of the world will tell you, I prefer to work with Kenyans. In the hospitality industry, we gave the world empress. We have given the world many things. And let me tell you, you are the generation you are the young suckers that will grow when we, the old bananas, die. So don't think that there is nothing you can do. There is a book that I want you, two books I want you to go and read. One of them is, was written in 1933 by an American educationist, Carter G. Woodson, Miseducation of the Negro. Read it. The other book that I want you to read, in fact, two of them by one author. One is Allah is Not Obliged by Amadou Kuruma. And the second one is Waiting for Wild Beasts to Vote, also by Amadou Kuruma. I have no doubt in my mind, in the month of October, I'm bringing to Nairobi 60 young people from 30 African countries who believe that peace and prosperity must be known in Africa. And I've just met a lady here who has parentage from Ukraine and Somalia. She has come here because she wants to be the salt and the light of Africa. When I look at your faces, I can say, like Simeon said on the birth of Christ, I can now leave. It is done. So you Rotaractors, as I conclude, you are in a good place. 
because you belong to an organization, the Rotary Club. How I wish we could elect our president like Rotary elect their president, so that you know them in advance. Perhaps we should think about it. The Swiss do that, almost like Rotary, so that this cutthroat competition for the presidency and even any other seat, we have cutthroat competition and throats are actually cut. So you go out there, do what which, that which is good and right. 